Um, I think we'll we'll slowly get started here. Um, we um, I wanted to take a few minutes just to introduce um, the co-hosts tonight, um, and then uh, quickly go around. And I do see that there are quite a number of regional coordinators on tonight as well, and so it might be nice to have them just really quickly say say hello as well. Um, so I'm the I'm Julie. I'm the project coordinator. Um, and I'm really glad to see a lot of really familiar names, but I haven't seen your faces yet. So this is really good for me. Um, it's great to actually see you guys. Um, and then uh, for co-hosts tonight, we have uh, Greg Lawrence. Greg, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Want to say a little bit what your role is, uh, how you're involved with the Atlas? Sure. Um, so. Again, my name is Greg Lawrence. Um, I am a research scientist at SUNY Brockport near Rochester, New York. And uh, I'm the vice president right now of NYSOA and have been on the steering committee for the Atlas for uh, for quite a while now. And uh, I've been working now on the methods committee for quite, quite some time. I just re-muted everyone. It looked like some people had unmuted. Um, Great, thanks, Greg. And Matt, do you want to say something? Hi, everybody. Thanks for, for joining us. Uh, my name is Matt Medler, and I am one of the regional coordinators for the Northern Region, uh, together with Jeff Bolsinger and Tom Wheeler. And when I'm not atlasing, uh, I work as the collections manager at the Macaulay Library at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And you were heavily involved with the second breeding bird atlas, too. Yeah, uh, I participated as a as a atlaser and then also uh, helped uh, help some with the publication of the book. Great. So Matt is going to be helping me uh, monitor the chat box tonight. Um, and while Greg and I do most of the answering, although Matt will chime in and, and maybe some of the regional coordinators as well. Um, and so really quickly, I think uh, we have Brandon, Molly, um, Wendy, Gail, you guys want to introduce yourselves? Brendan, you want to go first? Sure. Hi, uh, this is Brendan Fogarty. I'm one of the coordinators for the New York City Long Island area. Great. Molly, I saw you there. Sure. Hi, I'm Molly Adams, and I'm the other or one of the other regional coordinators for the New York City and Long Island area. And then I, I work in New York City Audubon. Um, we have Andrea. Can you hear me? Yep, now I can hear you. Okay, cool. So you're not going to see me tonight because I have some dental work done and my cheek is swollen up like a chipmunk. But I am one of the regional coordinators for the Western region, and I help out with Central as well. And when I'm not doing that, I'm the director of the Braddock Bay Bird Observatory here in Rochester, New York. Thanks for coming this night here. <laughs> yeah, so I probably won't talk much either. Great. Um, Anne? Sweet. Hi, I'm Maybe she's not connected to audio yet. Right, we'll go to someone else first. Who do we have? I think Gail, I saw you somewhere. Okay. Hi, I'm Gail Verhaeg. I'm one of the regional coordinators for the Western section. And then Wendy, I saw you on there too. I haven't heard you yet, Wendy. Are you there? There you are. We see you now. I can't hear you. <laughs> okay, so Wendy's having sound issues, it sounds like. Um, Wendy is in the Hudson Valley region. And then, Ian, I saw you're on now. Do you want to just say? Introduce yourself real quick. Um, hang on, you're muted. Okay, you're unmuted. Hey there. Hello, everybody. Anne is down in the lower Hudson, Westchester County. 
think that's all. Is that all of the meeting coordinators? Perhaps there's a Z, and I don't know if that's Zach. Anyways. Um, <laughs> well, uh, so we have quite a quite a good representation of people from all over state, and I I recognize a lot of names that are I I've seen here and there through emails and on the on the uh, Facebook page and um, elsewhere. So um, welcome everyone, and this is our second town hall meeting, and uh, the first one we kind of focused on the three Atlas essentials. And tonight I wanted to dive in a little bit deeper into breeding code issues. And I'm not gonna, gonna speak very much um, because I want I know that you guys have a lot of questions. I've been fielding a ton of questions, and I think um, you know, right now a lot of birds are, are getting really active and um, starting to feed even a lot of the um, of the passerines and hatching and so there's a lot of activity out there so you know you guys have a lot of questions so um i am going to open it up to the chat so again if you have questions um if you hover over the screen there should be a, a thing that pops up and it has the it's where you can see your your microphone your video and all that and um, one of them is the chat window so if you open that chat window that's where we're asking you to submit your questions. And then some of these guys I have an echo. Two people at once. Jeez, Swift. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Yeah, so to me, is one of those that um, uh, if you see it, then I would definitely at least do an H. If you see it going into a chimney or into a, um, a, a hollowed out tree somewhere, um, then you can you can code that as um, you can code it as either N as visiting probable nest site or as occupied nest. So if it's um, if it goes in and kind of stays there, then you, then you would still terrible feedback. Okay. Let me hang on. Let me just remute everyone again. Let's see if that helps too. Does that help people with my volume, my sound? Okay, good. Um, yeah, so if it goes into a chimney, say, and, and kind of and stays in there, then it's then it's an occupied nest. Um, if you just see it going in quickly and it's early in the season, then then it might be just a visiting a probable nest site. Um, and so yeah, those are those are the most common codes to use for that species. So I see a question that um, that we discussed yesterday, which is, um, what do we do with uh, goldfinches and, and cedar waxwings? Um, now we're into June, uh, so these are some of our later breeders in the state. Typically think of them as the latest breeders uh, breeding in July. Um, so what do we do if we're seeing them now? Uh, I guess there are several different scenarios. So, so Brian's question, uh, Brian's question was, um, what do you do if you see goldfinches or waxwings? In a, in a group of four to ten birds, uh, if if it's just four to ten birds, I um, I would either not code them at all. Actually, I would I would not code them at all. Uh, if they're still flocking, uh, then I would not consider them to be to be breeding. Um, it gets more complicated um, when you started you start to see uh, pairs or you start to see more um, more typical breeding behavior. So. Uh, I, I have seen some pairs, even in northern New York, I've seen some pairs of cedar waxwings in appropriate habitat, and I've coded those as, as P. Um, similarly, I know uh, Chris Wood has recently seen uh, goldfinches uh, starting to build nests. Uh, so we are starting to see uh, breeding behavior for these later breeders. Uh, but if they are flocking, 
I would consider them to, to not be in, in the breeding mode yet. And I would say at this point, um, if you're seeing just one or two individuals, and you can count that as a habitat, you can code it as an H already. Um, I've been tracking the maps for both of those species, and there's a, a number of confirms for both all across the state. So um, it seems like some are some are getting ready and or starting, and, and some are still flocking. But if you see just one or two, then then code it as an H or a pair if you see two. Yeah, there's been a lot of reports of waxwings and um, goldfinches starting to build nest already. So. So, so I saw a question of uh, to basically if we have a species already confirmed, is it okay to still document um, what, what kind of breeding codes we see? Um, and I would definitely say say that yes. Um, you know, to keep putting down if if you know whatever behavior code. You know, if you're coding a species um, and you observe that behavior, like that is totally a valid observation. Um, it's not going to downgrade that or anything from a block. If you've already confirmed it in the, that block, that's that's going to be confirmed. But, you know, that's going to be more of a situation, too, when you get into later years. Like, you know, next year, if you already have a bird that you've confirmed, but you find another nest or you have that bird singing in your block, you know, keep keep recording it. Keep putting it. Um, keep putting your behavior observations on there as well. So I would say yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, that information, like the more data points we have, the better we can really understand um, phenology, so the timing of breeding across the state. Um, so we can really, really hone in on when birds are, are starting to nest um, across in different regions. So there was another, another question that I've never really thought about, but which apparently is quite popular. Um, what do you do if you find egg fragments on the ground? You can ID to species, but you don't see a nest nearby. Yeah, that's a, a really common question. I've been getting a lot lately. Um, and so there's, there's two things that, you know, that we need to be sure of for any observation. We need to be sure of the species and we need to be sure of the block that it's located in. Um, so the, the, if you're seeing, um, Big fragments that have just been dropped somewhere on the trail on the side of the road. It's really not clear if that egg fragments, you know, was from the block that you're in or from a different block. So you know, it could be that the parent removed the egg fragment from its nest and dropped it nearby, or it could be that it's from a predator. And if it was a crow or a jay, they could fly quite a ways and, and cross block boundaries. So for that reason, we're saying don't code those eggshell fragments that you see. Now, if you see, if you do see the adult carrying the eggshell from the nest and then dropping it, then that you do code, and that's um, goes under the fecal sac code. So it's fecal sacs and egg fragments. Um, so basically, when they're trying to clean their nest out, um, so that one, those you do code that way. Um, yeah. So we, we're not off the hook so easily with chimney swifts, apparently. Uh, so what happens if you see a, a pair, a couple of birds, which I'll interpret as a well, what happens if you see a couple of birds flying around and twittering how to code S, H, or P? Yeah, so they will, um, their courtship consists of them flying really closely together in flight and they'll, they'll kind of mirror each other. They'll even copulate in flight. Um, and so if you're seeing them doing that where they're flying like really close to each other, and then I would count that as a pair. Um, Twittering, I, I wouldn't count as singing. Um, and then if you're seeing like three of them just kind of flying around randomly, then I would do an H. Yeah, I'll just I'll just respond to the one that was kind of building off of the 
um, talk about keeping coding species. Um, once you've already confirmed a species or once you've already gotten a species um, to a certain level um, for codes, you know, yeah, yes, definitely continue to uh, document those repeat, those breeding codes. And the benefit, you know, the, the biggest thing is we're learning about phenology. Um, as we know, some of these birds, their ranges and their behaviors are changing a lot um, rapidly. Some are arriving and they're beginning to nest earlier or later um, than others. And so we can learn a little bit more about uh, these species by continually uh, coding all of the breeding behaviors that you see, even if you, you're not necessarily upgrading the code. I see a question about uh, portals. Um, I'm not sure the exact um, the exact question. Um, the the question is, uh, how do you get back to regular eBird when you are in the portal? I'm new to eBird and seem cut off from other birders in the portal. Um, so if you're on the eBird website and you're exploring, like if you go into my checklist, if your if your most recent checklist is is an atlas checklist, which hopefully it is, uh, it will. Uh, the URL, the web link will be ebird.org, and then it will say slash Atlas New York, and then it will have the checklist. Um, so if you ever want to just get back to eBird to use the Explore eBird in general and not Atlas specific, uh, you can just go to ebird.org, uh, and that will get you back to the, the main eBird page. Um, if for some reason, say you're traveling out of state or you're birding in a case where you're not Atlasing, I don't know why that would be the case, uh, but uh, but if you do want to move out of the portal uh, for data entry, uh, you can go into your settings and go down to um, the portal setting and change it from uh, Atlas back to um, back to just the regular eBird. And I'll share a link in the in the chat about how exactly to do that. A couple things I've done if I've wanted to see a page or something um, and not not on the Atlas portal um, that slash Atlas NY section of the URL, um, you can actually just highlight and delete and it'll just, and then hit enter again and it'll take you to the regular, that same page on the regular um, eBird portal. The other thing that I find really useful that I do all the time um, is I have it, uh, it bookmarked, like the regular eBird um, homepage. You can put it like my eBird or your home county or, or the homepage and you can just bookmark that on your browser. And so if you're all of a sudden get stuck in a page in, the Atlas portal or something like that, you can just click on that and you'll go right back to the regular one. And it just helps to get to eBird quickly anyways. Um, I can answer Stacy's question about bobolinks. Um, they're singing and doing their bobbing, bobbing around floppy flight over the fields. Um, then, yes, that is courtship display, and you can code that as a C. Um, Blue Jays calling, is that considered an S for singing? No. I haven't been coding it that way. I've just been doing H for them because they'll, they make those same sounds all year round. Yeah, and, and Blue Jays actually do. Um, Blue Jays do actually have a song. Um, it's heard very rarely, but it's kind of one of those cool things if you're out in the field a lot. You'll see a blue jay just kind of giving this soft, kind of rambling whisper song. A lot of a lot of corvids around the world do sing, but just very rarely. So, fortunately, I feel like blue jays are fairly easy to confirm. Otherwise, usually it's not too hard to find their nests, or at least uh, find them carrying food. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so then somebody else followed up about bobolinks too and said they have a male carrying food. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it can be hard to see the young and the females. Eventually, you will see the females also carrying food for the young too. Um, and so, I mean, the CF code is fine. I mean, that's that's confirmed and you don't need to you don't need to try to get a higher code for them. So yeah, just keep it as occupied nest or, or carrying food, whatever it is that you're seeing. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll add a little bit to that and grassland birds in general. Um, so bobolinks specifically, you can see their young become really, really obvious um, out in grasslands starting in like mid mid July, basically to the to the end of July, and you can really see a lot of their their young um, everywhere. Um, in terms of like nest searching in grasslands, I mean, I. I one one comment I just want to add is to use caution in those habitats. You know, you don't want to kind of trample the habitat or potentially trample any of the nests. You know, just just be careful if you're out there really looking for nests. They're hard to find, and so you know you can you can get lucky, but they're um, just just be careful. Sometimes um, you're not trampling the grasslands too much. And I would add that it's not necessary to find their nests. Um, it's you know as long as you if if it's confirmed, then it's confirmed. You don't need to try to try to find the exact nest too. So if you're already out there and doing surveys, then then great. But um, you don't need to go tracing through the through the through the meadow. Let's see, um, any other questions? Uh, so Brian uh, Swift asked, um, "How do I document a new observation location?" When I'm no longer there, for example, to record a species seen while out for a walk in another block without my phone. Um, so first thing, never go anywhere without your phone. Um, <laughs> my my wife might disagree with that. In fact, she does. Um, but um, I guess the key thing when you're atlasing is to always uh, always try to know where you are. Uh, in that particular case. Um, I would just note where I was uh, if I'm out for a walk in a familiar area. And then when I went back home, I would probably still use the mobile app uh, to create a checklist and just uh, use the map interface to, to plot that. Or you could do it, you could do it on the web based application as well. And in that case, unless you noted all the birds there, I would just do it as, a, as an incidental checklist. That's what I'll do sometimes if I see, uh, if I see like a pair of kestrels on a wire or something when I'm driving. I can't do it while I'm driving, uh, but I'll take note of the, the nearest road and uh, I can go back and do that retroactively. Uh, here's, yeah, Stacy uh, Robinson asked another one that she had asked me and I uh, deflected that last week. Uh, so I'll say that for you, Julie. Um, although I do have an answer of sorts. Uh, uh, and I'm not going to do the imitation, but what if an American bittern is, uh, Giving their vocalization, as Stacy said, the galunk galunk vocalization, uh, is that singing or is that uh, display? That's a great question. I have been coding it as display personally. Even if you don't see it. Yeah, even if I don't see it. Okay. Yeah, I think it's kind of like hearing a uh, like a woodcock do their kind of courtship. A little bit, not quite the same level, but even if you just hear it, you can probably code it as a um, as a C display. And I, know, I realize it's late for woodcock now, but uh, if you have a woodcock that just paints but you don't hear the aerial display, is that just is that S? Yes. Yep. There are still there is at least at least uh, one or two lonely woodcock in uh, northern New York still painting uh, and displaying. Yeah, we had one displaying uh, just last week, actually, just in Western New York still. So they're they're still going. And I know a couple of folks um, up north had reported snipe still winnowing as well. Um, hey Greg, there's one for you, Virginia Rail. Yeah, I, I've kind of wondered about that with the with the grunt because it's kind of um, you know it is really a grunt display. I I would consider it a display. Um, what would you think, Julie? Yeah, I think so. I had a while back. I had I had actually gone through all the birds in North America now birds of the world species accounts for all the rails. And it looks like, in terms of the, the our scientific understanding of what the purpose of a lot of those rail calls are, still not certain. 
Um, and so it, I think I think maybe the grunt, grunt, grunt call of the Virginia Rail is one of the ones that we're more sure about. So I'm okay with doing that one as courtship. But a lot of the other calls and sounds that they make, um, we're not really sure what they what they mean. So I would do those as um, singing. Uh, one of my fellow regional coordinators, uh, Jeff Bolsinger, is here uh, and just jumped right in with a very challenging question involving a, a hybrid warbler. Uh, so he had a female Brewster's warbler, uh, which is one of the uh, hybrids between blue winged warbler and golden winged warbler. So a female Brewster's doing a distraction display on a male blue winged warbler's territory. Is that mm -hmm. confirmation for? Brewster's warbler because we do there are there are atlas accounts uh, for for the hybrids so as a confirmation for Brewster's warbler uh, blue winged warbler or I'll throw out there or both and Jeff I'll throw it right back at you what, what how did you code it <laughs> you're the you're you're one of the resident experts in New York State on winged warblers those are the only ones with wings <laughs> yeah no, just kidding <laughs> Sorry, I refer to winged when I refer to winged warblers. I mean blue winged or golden winged warblers. I would say, like the first thing that I would ask Jeff is, um, did he have any any evidence that the the Brewsters were paired with the blue wings? Um, no. Hang on, I'm getting feedback again. I just muted everyone again. So, um, all right. So, if if you if you're pretty sure that they're that they're mated a mated pair, then yeah, I would I would code both because that means that they're both um, reproducing there. Um, if you're if you're not sure if they're maybe like just a little bit farther apart, and you're not sure if it actually is on the same territory. Then I would just do the Brewsters as confirmed. That's how I would do it. I mean, because that's similar to, in my mind, that's similar to if you see a cowbird egg in a nest. You, if you see a cowbird egg, you're going to code um, nest with egg for both the cowbird and for the host species. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Definitely. Here's uh, perhaps an easier one. Uh, so uh, speaking of distraction displays, uh, if you have two juncos come flying up from the side of a path and they continue to hang around acting agitated, is that a distraction display? I mean, I, I would say that's more... Agitated. Yeah, I would say that's more A, agitated behavior. Um, you know, something of a distraction display, think like a killdeer doing like a broken wing display or something like that. Um, that's kind of more what I think of the distraction. But if the birds are kind of chipping, at, you know, kind of angrily and all agitated, like that's that's kind of a classic um, A A code. Yeah. And most distraction displays, they're they're feigning injury think of it that way if they're just like upset at your presence and calling and flying all around you then I would do agitated okay we got another one um, that Brendan answered but I think it's it's probably worth repeating uh, Michael Greenwald asks are you interested in breeding data from non-priority blocks yes yes really so priority blocks are obviously our, our priority. Um, you know, we selected those so that we have like a minimum baseline of data that we collect. And if we get all of those blocks covered well, then um, we will have enough data to do the analyses that we want to do. But the, the more data we have and the more blocks, the better um, the, the better representation we have of their distribution in the state. 
Yeah, and I would say in non-priority blocks, I mean, if, if you know of a nest area or you know where certain species are nesting, like, you know, yeah, definitely feel free to um, to go and, and code some of those species. Um, the other, other thing in non-priority blocks is if there's one that has a really unique habitat, for example, you know, the, those are ones that we would... Uh, that would be especially beneficial. Um, we have one in Western New York that's this really big cedar swamp um, with an active, uh, with a fen, um, which is a very unique habitat. It's got a lot of birds that you don't get within you know, 50, 100 miles um, at least. And so, you know, it's not a priority block, but it's still kind of an interesting and unique habitat. So I would say definitely, um, definitely go birding and, and code stuff in, in some of those blocks. Uh, so we've got another question. Um, this is one that I can I can handle at least to start. Uh, so Rhonda Roaring asked, uh, I recorded a bird singing, but I couldn't identify the call. Do we have anyone who is willing to listen to these recordings? Uh, as someone who works at the Macaulay Library, uh, my suggestion would be to uh, to upload the recording uh, to your eBird checklist uh, to the highest level of certainty that you can. If you just know it's a bird, you can put in an observation for, for bird species and then upload it to that. And then once it's archived at the Macaulay Library, there's a link for that specific recording. And then you can share that link with other people. I have them listen to it. And then once someone gives you an ID, you can go back to your checklist and you can uh, change the, uh, the identification from bird species to, to whatever it is. Uh, so that's, that's one approach. Um, I just learned today of a Facebook group um, for North American bird sounds, and it looks like Julie maybe is familiar with that group or familiar with other 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 groups like that. If you don't want to upload, yeah, I was going to say to just put, you can also post it on our on the Atlas discussion group page too, and people will ID it for you if you're on Facebook. That is. Um, Stacy asks, owls hooting are considered song? Yes. Fox calling are not coded as singing. That's correct. Okay. Um, Steve had a question. Um, Steve Walter had a question. When do filters get updated? Uh, in my area, we have a cliff swallow colony, uh, but we have to keep entering it as a rare species. Or if you have a family with fledglings, uh, how can it, well, uh, or if you have a family with fledglings, how can a number more than two get flagged? For example, common raven. I can answer the first one. Um, so uh, filters, uh, filters are maybe a mystery to much of the eBird using community. Uh, the filters are set up not at the county level. Uh, they're set up at the Kingbird region level. Uh, so my favorite example is from, from my review area, which is the Adirondack Champlain region. So that goes from about 96 feet of elevation, where we now have Carolina wrens and uh, red-bellied woodpeckers moving northward towards the border with Quebec, uh, up to Mount Marcy at 5,200 feet, uh, with Bicknell's thrush and black pole warblers at the tops of the mountains. Uh, that entire region has one set of filters. Uh, so it's up to the uh, volunteer regional reviewers uh, mm -hmm. to try to find the best filters. Uh, and find a balance between, um, well, there's a balance. Um, in the case of Carolina wrens, uh, if I make the Carolina wren filter very liberal, say that it doesn't get flagged until there's five Carolina wrens, that means that somebody could report a Carolina wren from the top of Mount Marcy and it wouldn't get flagged. Uh, the alternative is uh, if I have the Carolina wren filter at zero, uh, Stacy Robinson and other active birders are filling out details every single day uh, for Carolina wrens down in the Champlain Valley. Uh, so it's really a, a balancing act of, of trying to uh, deal with those two things. So if cliff swallow is a, is a rare local breeder, which it is in many places, uh, that's probably why um, it gets flagged every time. And probably um, once, you've, once you've given details the first time, what I would recommend is just say uh, known, known colony location. And uh, a reviewer should accept it after that, after that first time where you give more details. Uh, no location should do the trick. Yeah. There's a lot of questions coming in. 
I, I can tackle this one. It looks like um, somebody had a question about, um, oops, where did it go? I'll answer one quickly while you're while you're looking for it. Uh, so Alyssa asked if we submit sightings while in the portal, but not in a priority block, the sighting is still included in the breeding bird atlas. Yes, definitely yes. All sightings from New York State are included in the atlas. And when you keep short checklists, stationary or very short duration checklists, um, we'll know that you're we'll know exactly what block you're in and it will get coded to that block. Um, I'll add to that though, if if you're entering your data into the, the regular the core eBird portal, then it won't be in the Atlas. So it has to be in the Atlas portal. But if you haven't done that, you can always go back and you can always you can always change a checklist from one portal to another. Yeah. Um, okay. This is a question I get a lot too, so I'll answer it here. Um, and that question is how do you submit sightings for somebody else? Okay, so in general, the policy is that you should not be entering someone else's sightings into your account. It looks like uh, Julie just froze there. Okay, you're back. Yeah, I froze, sorry. Um, it's a very dramatic answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, so if the other person is going to be doing a lot of atlasing, um, then I would really try to set that person up with a separate eBird account. And you know, you can do it, you can you can do it with them, you can enter the data for them, but just put it into a separate account. If it's just gonna be um, you know, just a sighting here or there, um, then then we, you can email that record to your regional coordinator because we have a, um, a form that uh, basically a spreadsheet where we are um, submit, you know, recording those uh, single observations of interesting things. Um, and then if I, I'll add to that, if you know somebody who is going to be submitting a lot of data who doesn't use eBird and and isn't able to use eBird for what, whatever reason, um, and you can't enter data for them, then you, if you let a regional coordinator or myself know, we do have volunteers who have signed up to enter data for other people. Um, so we can we can arrange for that person to send their, their paper observations to that person and they will enter it for them. So, so I'll, I'll, I'm going to tackle a really quick question here about how to switch the portals. Um, so if you have, if you like leave the state, for example, and go birding, um, you know, in Pennsylvania or something like that, and uh, don't want that in the breeding bird atlas portal or uh, vice versa or something. Um, so you go to the checklist right on the desktop, go to your checklist page that has a checklist there. Um, there's a big blue rectangle on the upper right corner and it says checklist tools and you click that it'll have a drop down menu and right about in the middle there is change portal and so you click on change portal and it'll have a drop down menu of all the different eBird portals and if you go down um it's a little bit uh It'll, you know, it's alphabetical here. And so you basically go down there and click on the New York Breeding Bird Atlas. And then uh, you can switch that to the portal. Or you can switch it to, you know, eBird in general if, if it's uh, a case where you're birding out of state and don't want it in the portal. So hopefully that, hopefully that helps. Okay, so there's a bunch of questions coming in. Um... Uh, so, uh, Charlie and Sandy had a question. Uh, in eBird Mobile, what does the red dot unreported and non species taxa mean? Uh, why does it come up for fairly common birds in our area, like brown thrasher? Um, that is often the source of confusion. Uh, I should probably know better than I do. Um, my understanding is that the, that's based on uh, is it the 50, is it 50 kilometer grids? That sound right, Greg and Julie? I think it's 20. 20? Okay. Um, 
So eBird eBird basically breaks up areas by 20 kilometer by 20 kilometer grids. So um, those red dots or those orange semicircles are based on uh, the data that's entered into eBird for complete checklists uh, for that area. Um, so it should be accurate. Uh, the one exception to that is uh, rock pigeon feral. Uh, there seems to be some sort of glitch with that and I walk around my apartment every night and I report rock pigeons every night and it always comes up with a red dot. So um, it should be accurate ex except in that case. Um, and sometimes you might be at the edge of a block um, that's mostly forested. And, you know, so I had Savannah Sparrow come up recently from a, a, a nice grassland where I would expect, expect it, but then came up as a red dot, but that's because overall, you know, that's a very small field and what's otherwise a forested habitat. So Sometimes you need to think at a at a broader level as to why it might might be rare. And I want to second um, just to reinforce what uh, Alejandra answered somebody's question too about um, uh, you know if if data is useful if you're entering just an X instead of a count for individual number of birds. Um, and yes, we can still use an X, but if you put a number on there, then we can use your data in a lot of more ways. So if you can put a number on there, that's even better. So just go, going back to explain some of the red and orange dots and, you know, kind of prop good e-birding protocol. Um, you know, some blocks that you're, you're going into have poor coverage. And so some some of those species might come up as as a red dot or an orange dot. Um, in some of the more heavily birded blocks, if you get something with an orange or red dot, um, that's that you know means it's it's interesting. It may not be flagged necessarily, but it's one that typically I would recommend adding just a few comments for. Whether it's, it's just about the location, what it was doing, um, you know, you don't have, need to have a huge description on identification or anything, but Adding a few comments, just making note of it that it's something maybe a little less common, um, is is really good good protocol and, and helps um, helps you kind of understand uh, and and learn some of the um, basically the occurrences of species in your region and also just makes your eBird checklist a little bit a little bit better. Um, somebody, asked about, sorry, somebody asked about woodpeckers. How to code woodpeckers. So if you hear drumming for any woodpecker, then that acts as their song. That's the the function that it's forming uh, performing. So um, you can count any drumming as as singing. Um, and then also the pileated woodpecker and flickers have a, what's called a long song, um, and those also count as singing for those species. That's what the question was about. Uh, and um, please ask again. Isn't there an issue? Yeah, and then I'll, 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 yeah, well? I'll, I'll also. Oh, sorry. I'll go for it. I'll also add just real quick with woodpeckers and, and wrens, you know, um, you know, their nest building and everything, you know, they have a special code. Um, so just just keep an eye on on that um, and and make sure you code them as the the B code for woodpecker or wren. I think it's B, right? Um, their their nest building because they have a, a separate code for that. Sorry for the red squirrel here behind me making all the noise. <laughs> I think you're really you're just showing off that you're in the outer round X. Hey, we had a red squirrel in our backyard in Albany, so. Can, can I touch on like just general Atlas strategy real quick? Um, if you don't mind, just before we get back to some of the questions. Um, just one thing about, you know, I, I, a handful of people have asked me, you know, how do you approach, you know, going into a block and, and how do you approach kind of your strategy for completing it, right? You know, it, it, it can seem a little bit daunting at times, but it's actually not, not too bad. Um, so one of the approaches I, I really like to do um, Early on in the season, um, I basically go out, you know, if I know of raptor nests or, you know, I might look for those, or if I know there's a marsh with something like Canada geese, which are early nesters, I might look for those, um, as well as you know, trying to get courting woodcocks in every block. 
But for the most part, you know, I wait until um, kind of the end of May. Right now, this time of year is perfect for it. And you basically go out and at this at this time, you're really just looking for looking to kind of build your species list in a block, right? You know, you're not going to be getting a ton of confirmations because a lot of those are much easier later on. But one of the big things now is you can really build that species list and figure out what's in your block. And then um, so if you kind of drive a lot of the roads or walk some of the trails and in the parks if you're lucky and have some good public land in your habitat or in your block um you basically hit all those habitats and basically develop your species list which you know for a lot of people might be about around 75 for example on average it might be a little lower or, or higher in, in some blocks um of course depending on the habitat and where you are in the state um and then kind of later on in the in the season, you can look at and see which species you missed, uh, which species you would expect based on the habitat in your block. Like, you know, there's there's a big swamp, but somehow, you you know, you weren't able to see a swamp sparrow. You know, you can kind of target those. Start to have young nests and start to have fledged young and everything. It's a lot easier to get confirmations. And so once you've kind of developed that species list and that really big idea of, of all the species that are kind of in that block, you can start focusing on in on some of those to, to confirm them. But this time of year is perfect for basically just going out, listening, walking the trails, driving the roads, and basically building your species lists for those. So I just wanted to, I had a lot of people ask me about some stuff of that, like that. So I kind of wanted to just, just briefly touch on that a bit. Yeah, and I think people that are new to Alicing sometimes feel like they're not being productive and they don't really know what they're doing and like, am, am I doing this right? And and I, there are, um, you know, if, if you follow these strategies, then, then that will help. I also, um, in the last newsletter, put in some strategies to help you as well. Um, and then, you know, right now, the last like two weeks around Albany anyways, it's been super quiet and it's been really hard to get confirmations, but that's because a lot of birds are on nests right now. And then pretty soon, like, you know, starting in mid June, everything's going to be hatching and their birds are going to be feeding, feeding young like crazy. And, um, and it's going to get a lot easier. Um, so just stick with it and don't get too frustrated yet. Yeah, I think that's a great point that that everything, you know, kind of shuts up singing right after after a little while. Yeah, you know, this is the time when you go out and walk a trail or go out in your block. Um, you know, when you when you look at your list at the end of the day, you know, most species when you're walking a trail, you're actually detecting just by song. And and that's just, you know, that's one benefit of birding now and atlasing now is you can really document pretty much everything that's in there. Some some of those birds by song like um, up here in the Adirondacks, winter wren, for example, you know, that's, that's not always the easiest bird to actually see on breeding territory. But boy, when they're singing, I mean, you, you can hear them um, if, if they're there. Um, so it's, yeah, kind of taking advantage of, of each time of year and, and what the birds are actually doing is, is really helpful. Yeah. Uh, there's a question that I think might have gone off the chat page now, but I wanted to get back to it. Um, it <clears throat> was from uh, Scott Jones. Um, he said, I sometimes forget to start a new checklist when I go into another block. I think we've all done that. Um, but I want to use the map option. Is there a way to fix the map in eBird? I know there's no way to do it in the mobile app, or should I just make a note of it? You can actually edit your track in the mobile app. Um, That's the place to do it, right? Yeah, that is that is the best place to do it. You can when you go to the map on the bottom of the screen, there's a little slider and you can slide it back in time and, and then it will shorten it to wherever you stop it to. So you can drag that slider back to when you were at the border um, and stop the checklist there and then create a new one for the, the new block. Yeah, the, the other thing about that's really nice about the mobile app is that, um, I, and I'm not, I can't speak entirely for the Android version, but um, in the iPhone version, you have you, you can still even if you're offline, you don't have uh, any cell signal, you can still actually see your track. You can't see the satellite map behind it, but you can see your track still, and you can see the block boundaries still. 
even when you're totally offline and you're you're doing that checklist offline, if you click on your track, you can still see it. So you can track on your phone, because I've done this last couple of days with terrible signal up here in the Adirondacks. Um, you can basically see. Speaking of terrible signal. Um, and what he's saying is also true on Android. I can speak to that as well. Um, Yeah, so there's still some questions here about the um, editing your track. Um, you, def you definitely want to edit it before you submit it. Um, and then, yeah, afterwards, I'm not sure you can edit the, I don't think you can edit the track after you submit the checklist, but you can change the, the length in the checklist details. You can say that it was a shorter checklist um, and change it that way. And then the other thing to do besides besides changing the distance um, is changing the species list too. If you mm -hmm. if you realize that you started to count species in the new block on your old checklist, make sure to take those those species or those individuals off if you can remember. And the other you know basic eBirding um, thing that I know I get a lot of questions about is. Um, when you're doing like an out and back trail, right? There's one trail that takes you to an overlook, for example, and it's a half mile. Um, if you walk that trail out to that overlook and then walk back, um, you know, you, you, your track is going to say it's a mile, but you really should shorten it to that half mile, um, that distance. Basically, if, if you've got, if you've backtracked, you just want to account for that distance um, that you've gone once. And I can answer Adelia's question too about if you if you are if you know you're going to be crossing a block boundary a couple of times and so you go you go up to the block boundary and you stop the checklist that you're on. She says pause, but I think um, you mean like to temporarily stop it um, so that it, it doesn't continue tracking you and but you don't submit it and then you start a new checklist for the other block and then if you want to go back to that old checklist, you cannot have it restart tracking your where you move to. That's not possible. Um, so you should really just start a new checklist. You should stop the old ones and just start a new one. So this this question's come up a bit. Um, getting back to the New York New Jersey uh, border issue, uh, but more broadly, is, is there a way to flag a, an atlas report that you know is incorrect? Um, the answer to that is is no. Um, there's no mechanism in eBird for there's no mechanism for reporting a checklist of poor quality or one that went across the border or or an observation that you think is very likely wrong. Um, the only thing that you can flag in the eBird Macaulay Library environment is uh, media that you think is incorrectly identified. Um, so if you if someone submitted a photo that they accidentally put a black cap chickadee photo for tufted titmouse. Um, if you've submitted a certain number of checklists the year before, you um, when you look at that picture, you can uh, flag it and then say, "Oh, this is actually a tufted, uh, black cap chickadee." But you can't. There's no systematic way to flag a checklist. So I think right. that's a recurring issue. I would try to try to interact with the community via listservs or whatever way people are communicating and try to. Try to reach people that way in advance. Um, yeah, and I'll just add to if if you know of such a checklist. I mean, I get emails all the time from people saying that, um, particularly that example that was brought up at Liberty Marsh, um, with people going across the border and not stopping their checklist. Um, so you can also, you know, send me the the link to that checklist or a regional coordinator or something, and they'll get it to me, um, and then and it'll be flagged for us to look at later as well. And you know, if that if it's somebody who's doing it repeatedly, um, you know, I can always reach out to them as well, or the or the regional coordinator is another option. You can't just flag it in in eBird. The questions come up uh, a couple times now about uh, the number of confirmed species. Uh, so the example is uh, blocks with 90 to 100 species. Uh, does that mean that we need 45 to 50 confirmed species? Yes. 
I was gonna say, I'll let Julie, I'll, I'll let Julie be the bad guy there. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. But it's easier to confirm now than it was in the old Atlas. Yeah, I mean, I, I, some some of the blocks are really tough. Like if if you have blocks where you have, you know, major migration corridors, it's it's pretty difficult to conf You know, and, and there there are some blocks I know that have like, you know, well over a hundred you know coded species, but a lot of those not, aren't necessarily breeders. Um, you know, so right, ones yeah. that might have like 120, 130 coded species. You know, you're I, I would. I would not say you're expected to code, you know, 60 to 70, you know, as, as confirmed because there might not, you know, there might barely be more than that actually breeding in the block. Yeah. So, so the answer would be to Greg, you're talking about like, like here in Ithaca, we get displaying ducks during the winter time. So they're doing courtship displays and, and we've encouraged people to just code those. But redhead do not breed on Cuyahoga Lake or probably almost anywhere in the state except for around Montezuma. So, so you, I guess if you have a list of 120, you need to look and see like, okay, even though I coded this species, um, it's really not breeding here. So I guess there's kind of a functional list of species uh, that would get it down to a more manageable number. Seem reasonable, that, that thought process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is this is something we're actually going to address um, in the, within the methods committee um, because yeah yeah because I mean there there are some areas like up on the lake shore in Rochester um, with blocks that have, have huge numbers of species because you have a lot of migrants that have been singing and uh, you know folks have coded those as as s um, for singing um, and those you know some of those birds don't even even nest in in New York. Um, yeah, so we're we're gonna work on on that a little bit, but um, you know, for most blocks, um, I don't quite get up to that. Um, yeah, the fifty percent confirmed is still still something that you you should uh, you should be striving for. Yeah, well, we are already at seven thirty, um, and I did want to um, put a, a short plug in for. Um, Actually, let me just um, send the link. There is um, Audubon New York and Audubon Connecticut are hosting a webinar a week from today. Um, and I just sent you the link if you want to register. And it's about um, breeding birds in your in your backyard and or around where you live. So um, that. I don't know exactly how it's going to be set up or what the content is, but um, it may be of interest to some of you um, as well. So I'll just share that link. Um, and then, yeah, I wanted to make sure that um, everyone does know about the Facebook discussion group. If you're not already, if you're on Facebook, I know some people are not, um, but if you are, that is a really great place to ask questions. Um, and, and get answers from from myself and other regional coordinators and other atlasers as well. Um, so that's really, really a, a great resource that's available to you. Can we squeeze in one last question? Sure. So Annie Berry asked, is there a place where I can find my list of confirmed species? And I was all set to write back and say, yes, go to my atlas stats and click on species confirmed. Oh. And I did that and it took me to my eBird life list. Yes. Yes, that was discovered a little while ago. And I've talked to eBird about it. Um, and the long term plan is to make those stats link to your Atlas stats instead of your life stats. But for now, yeah, there's no way to see um, the list of confirmed species that you have confirmed so far. I found that really frustrating myself too. So I feel your pain. All right, well, I think we should stay close to on time and I think we will um, sign off. I wanna thank everyone for coming and participating and I look forward to hopefully meeting you all in person someday be great <laughs> thank you everyone Thanks, and uh and good luck atlas sing it is a beautiful time of year to be out
Thanks, everyone. Bye.